Attention American poker players, do you want to legally cash out your poker winnings to PayPal? Then head to GlobalPoker.com and see why it's the fastest growing site for US players. That's GlobalPoker.com. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome back to Poker Stories, brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. Today's episode features Jonathan Little, a two-time World Poker Tour champion who was also WPT Season 6 Player of the Year. Little has more than 6.5 million in live tournament earnings, and millions more won online. Jonathan has established himself over the last decade as one of the hardest working players in the game. Even when he's not on the road playing or doing commentary for live streams, Jonathan lives in New York with his wife and son, working on poker training videos, hand packs, live webinars, and private coaching. He's already authored more than a dozen poker books, including his latest, which is available now, called Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em, Strategies to Consistently Beat Small Stakes Tournaments and Cash Games. Enough intro, here's my conversation with Jonathan Little. I am here with Jonathan Little. Hello. Uh, we are pretty close to the Las Vegas Strip. <laughs> About as close as you can be, but not beyond it. Yes. And uh, you're here for the uh, the annual summer series where you hope to to win big. I have this yet is... to have a good specific <laughs> World Series. I've, I've had a few very deep runs. I guess that makes for a good enough series, but no mm-hmm. bracelets yet. Let's get a bracelet this year. Let's add up all your good runs for every World Series you've ever been to into one summer. Yeah. Boom, player of the year. Well, if I had added all of it together, but had all the bad run for the last 12 years, I'd <laughs> almost certainly be broke. So it's, it's nice that they spread it out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, better they spread it out. Uh, so this is what, 12 years then, huh? Coming well, to the series or 11? I, or? I am 32. So this must be my 11th. Yeah, 11 years. How how you liking it in year 11? It's great. Still? <laughs> Still as fun as the first day you walked in? It's always exciting, especially as I've stopped playing so much poker. I mean, mm. even like three or four years ago, I was playing three weeks per month traveling the live circuit. Whereas over the last few years, I've tried to transition to where I could be at home with my family. So I'm only traveling maybe one week per month now on average. It, it's more exciting whenever you don't get to play quite as often because I get to study a lot, I get to mm-hmm. learn new things, and get to come out here and try to implement them. Yeah, you get to see uh, what worked in the laboratory out in the field. Exactly, and it's 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 more exciting because you know you only have a limited number of opportunities, whereas whenever you're playing all the time, if you lose, you just don't care because yeah. you have effectively infinite opportunities. Cool. Okay, well, we'll get to that. Let's go back to the beginning. Pensacola, Florida. Now, yeah. I'm a Miami kid. That's different than Pensacola. That's way different than Pensacola. <laughs> Explain to me what the panhandle's like. What, what, did you, what were you getting into as a kid? What was uh, little Jonathan doing? What was I into as a kid? I mean, I was just going to school as a kid. That's yeah. what all kids do. But I played this game, Magic the Gathering, as a kid. Mm-hmm. You were one of those, huh? I was one of those. Mm-hmm. Still am, I suppose. It's a lot of fun. They just had a big Magic tournament here in Las Vegas, and I went to that and played one day. I had to commentate the World Series of Poker, so I couldn't play their main events, but I played oh, okay. their side events. I won like 80% of my games, so that's good. Yeah. Lucky, probably. <laughs> it's a fun game. It's a fun thing to do. But I played baseball as a kid, and I played a trumpet in middle school and high school. I was very good at that. And I played chess a little bit. I was okay enough at that. So, I don't know. Played, get, played a bunch of games. I goofed off. You'll start to sense the jack-of-all-trades theme running throughout the podcast, I'm sure. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, you're into music, sports, and then Magic the Gathering. I mean, that's an eclectic childhood. I, I want to see what that group of friends look like. I didn't have any friends. Was, it, wasn't the, <laughs> it wasn't the Stand By Me crew, you know? No, none of that. I, I, I really didn't have a ton of friends growing up. I mean, I had a few close friends, but that was about it. I, I was never someone who had a large group of friends. I mean, now I do. Now I have lots of friends just because you meet everyone yeah, out here poker, on the poker circuit. And everyone in poker is so accepting. Right. And, you know, when you write books and coach a bunch of people, inevitably they're friendly to you and mm-hmm. you make friends with them. That's just how it works. Whereas if you don't talk to anyone, you won't make very many friends. <laughs> yeah. And so all you were of the introverted things, as a kid. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, all the things that I was good at, I was not naturally good at any of them. I was just realized I was okay at it. And I wanted to study it, and I practiced a lot mm-hmm. at all these things. And 
that's how I've gotten good at things is just devote a long time of your life, really hardcore to something. I say a long time, maybe six months or a year, Mm -hmm. get really good at it and then go from there. Like playing the trumpet, for example, I was just like marginal in middle school and in high school, I decided I want to get good. So one summer I practiced like eight hours a day, every day for three or four months. And then I went from being sort of middle of the pack to the best person in the county by just practicing a ton and devoting myself to it. Do you subscribe to that 10,000 hour rule? I don't know about 10,000 hours exactly, but I, I certainly think you need to put in a lot of dedicated practice to get good at something if you're not naturally gifted at it. I mean, I certainly was not naturally gifted at a trumpet. I should have played a baritone or something like that based on my, my mouth <laughs> structure. So I was playing the wrong instrument, but I was still reasonably good just because I put in a ton of dedicated practice, whereas all of my peers put in you know one hour per day. I was a trombonist. I probably could have been better at a trombone too. Better for my lips, I think. When yeah. I tried to play the trumpet, it hurt my lips. It was like too, like, it's like you know. That, you, you need little baby lips for a trumpet. That little face you got to make to make a trumpet go the high notes. Yes. How good were you? Did you ever get to use a mute? I use a lot of mutes. Okay. Three, three different kinds of That's mutes. That's how I can tell if a, trump, uh, if a trumpeter is a good trumpeter a or not. A straight mute, a Harmon mute, and a cup mute. You have mutes for all occasions. <laughs> yes. And when you practice at home, you need to use a mute as well. Otherwise, it'll drive your parents crazy. It's like the little drumming pad that they give the... Exactly. The sad boy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So you're playing instruments. You're playing baseball. You're gathering with your magic friends. <laughs> Um, does poker come early, early, or not until college? Or Poker comes after Magic the Gathering, basically. I was going to play Magic tournaments two or three times per week at local places. What's and a local place that has a... Because we're in most, Pensacola still. Mostly comic book stores or okay. like trading baseball card shops, things like that. They have tournaments on weeknights that start at maybe 6 or 7 o'clock and go till 10 or 11 or 12. And after that, one so day... So mom would drop you off at the... At the weird comic book guys. They would do that. My and... parents were actually really helpful with that. They would, I mean, we went to a few tournaments in like Jacksonville, Florida, and oh. Louisiana, and Orlando. And so they drove me around sometimes. But yeah. once I got a car, I could go more freely whenever I was 16. And you were good? Yeah, I was reasonably good. Because I've had Bryn Kenny on, and he was world number one at one point. And yeah. Justin Bonomo was on, and he was also, I think, pretty good. At I it. don't think I played as seriously as they did. I was a very good local player, and. The format I like to play, again, going back to just dedicating yourself to one specific thing, I think I got to like number 11 in the world on that a long time ago. Oh, okay. But it doesn't really mean anything because it was just some niche <laughs> format. And it was more so based on just playing a lot and beating your opponents, and my opponents were just not very good. A win is a win. A win is a win. You're right. And I had a lot of wins. I had a very good win percentage. <laughs> but the thing is, when you're playing against very weak players, win percentage is not worth a lot. Unless you're playing a game like poker where, you know, you go sit there and play one three no limit, and if you win 90% of your days, which... Yeah. You can probably do if you put in decently long sessions against weak players. That's You can make a decent living, even if you're playing small stakes. I want to get back to that as well. But we're still in Pensacola. We're still there. Okay, so after... Mom is still dropping you off at yeah. the comic book guy's shop. Well, so I didn't start playing poker with them until I was about 18 or 17. Well, it must keep, have been 17. Keep it legal. Yes, it's, let's call it... I was 23. <laughs> and... Um, Someone said, you, want, you guys want to play a, mag- a poker tournament after mm-hmm. our magic tournament. Everyone would buy in for 10 10 cent cards. Okay. One dollar, basically. And the winner would get all the cards. So we played with four or five people and... Oh, magic cards. Magic cards. That oh. was the buy-in. Okay. And these, were, these had real value or... Magic cards have real value, yes. I mean, like they're retail value. Retail value. Yeah. They're similar-ish to currency. You can sell them easily oh. on eBay or to other people. Oh, so, but everyone, so everyone's going Bitcoin, you're getting into magic cards, I get it. Yeah, that was probably a mistake on my part. <laughs> um, so we were all playing for basically a dollar buy-in, and I realized after two or three months of this that the same few people were winning most of the time, and mm-hmm. I knew that magic was a skill game, and I knew that chess was a skill game, so I decided to look into poker, and there were a few books, and I read all of those. Do you and, remember the first uh, one? Uh, I think it was Hold'em Poker for Advanced Players, which is a book on limits. So it didn't actually help me for No Limit, but I eventually put 50 bucks online and started playing Limit because that was the main game a long time ago on Party Poker. Um, so I started at 25 cent, 50 cent Limit with a $50 deposit and just ran it up. Never had the double dip? That was it. 50 bucks. I always kept, I thought a big bankroll of about 100 big bets for Limit Hold'em, which really was not enough, but whatever <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get into your poor bankroll management soon enough oh yeah poor bankroll management <laughs> i've been pretty good with it i think actually i've been good with it to a fault but well we'll get to that later yeah we'll get to we have a lot to talk about um right? yeah so okay so 
poker's going well, after you read this book, you're dominating your game, and uh, you take that to University of West Florida? Yeah, so I don't exactly remember the timeline at all. I don't remember anything, really. It all, it all blends together. And <laughs> the I was, dark years. I know I was working at a comic book store, running Magic Tournaments, playing Magic Tournaments, and working at, a, at an airport, fueling up airplanes. I knew about that job. I didn't know you were working at the comic book store. I was. I had two jobs. Oh, wow. And I was going to college. So okay. I quit the comic book job first and started playing less Magic, started playing more poker. Then I eventually quit the airport job. I was making about $10 an hour there, and I purposefully tried to work the graveyard shift because that is when the fewest planes came in, so that would allow me to play online poker. I would download Party Poker every night on the company computer, (laughs) and then I would delete it every morning. That was probably not ethical, but that's what we did. (laughs) And I would play Sit and Goes because that's what I was playing at that point. I had moved away from Limit Hold'em. I got to 30, 60 Limit Hold'em, and that was about as big as you could play back then. That was the highest limit. So... I like the sit and goes, two hundred dollar buy and sit and goes. I thought they were very soft. You could play a lot of them. There was way less variance it seemed than limit hold 'em, just because the sit and go players were not very good back then. And I'd studied it a decent amount. And sit and goes don't really work if you're working at an airport and someone comes in and wants to get fuel because you have to get up and muck eight hundred dollars or in sit and goes, which is exactly. not ideal. So after doing that a few times, I realized this is probably not a good job for me to have. So I quit my job, and then after that, I think my parents realized ahead of time he's probably going to quit his college job because they knew I was making maybe 20000 a month at this point as a 18-year-old kid, which is clearly ridiculous money. Yeah. And they were supportive. They they assumed I would always go back to college if I needed to. Well, what was the original college plan? What, what were you studying? In- I didn't really have a plan. I got I had an, edu- uh, an academic scholarship because I got good enough grades. Bright Futures. That Bright Future Scholarship, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and thank so you, I, State of Florida. Thank you. Your undergraduate, or any, everything worse than, I mean, everything lower than college is terrible. <laughs> but uh, the collegiate system, I'm very happy with. Bright Futures worked out real well for me. Well, I don't know. I quit. So I was going <laughs> to college with my Bright Future Scholarship, and I was studying engineering initially. But is that why you took the job at the airport? No, I, I took a job <laughs> at the. My mom actually worked at the airport when she was a kid. Oh, okay. And she got. The current boss, when I was working there, his job, so he owed her from <laughs> 20 or 30 years prior. There you go. So he got me a job, and that was fine. Actually, I was working at McDonald's before that, and I basically got let go because I decided to go to Atlanta to play a Magic tournament. They, I told them I was going a month ahead of time. They said okay. They confirmed it. Then I looked at the schedule that week. It said I'm working. I said, look, I'm not working. I'm going to Atlanta to play a Magic tournament. So I went to Atlanta to play a Magic tournament. I came back, and I didn't have a job. So <laughs> then I... Asked my mom to get me a job at the airport, and she did. There you go. So, anyway, engineering was getting a little bit too tough because I was playing poker all the time. So then I moved over to psychology, and then I wasn't really applying myself with that. I mean, I was doing fine enough. It was much easier than engineering. And I was just making too much money playing poker. I remember one day I was sitting there playing 10, 20, no limit in some psychology lab class where they gave you a computer, which was definitely a mistake. (laughs) And I remember I won something like $20,000 in the two hour class, which was just absurd. And then it was time to get up and go to the next class. And I just sat there and kept playing because, you know, (laughs) they're giving it away. If they're giving it away, I'm not getting up and leaving and going to class. (laughs) And they made you take a summer school class because of the bright future scholarship. That was a requirement for some reason, I guess, to keep the teachers employed. And I didn't really study, so I went in there, and I got a zero on my quiz, and then I just got up and left, and that was the end of my college career. You got a zero because you didn't fill it out, or because you I were didn't, that bad? I was that bad. I, it was, <laughs> so what I would typically do is just read the chapter reviews mm-hmm. at the end of the chapters, and none of the questions on the quiz were in the chapter review whatsoever, and I decided I'm going to go home and play some poker. Yeah. And here I am today. <laughs> okay, well, that, that contradicts your Wikipedia page, which says you dropped out with a 35K bankroll. So... I probably had more money than that when I dropped out. All right. Almost certainly. <laughs> it, it would Maybe seem... I had 35K in my party poker account or something like that. Actually, that, that can't be true either, because I remember at one point I had like 230K in my party poker account, which was way too much for $200 buy and sit and goes. And I never really... Yeah, there wasn't anything huge to even spend on at the time. Eventually, they made 500 and then $2,000 buy and sit and goes. And they ran a few $15,000 buy and sit and goes, but I wasn't ready for those yet. Yeah. But I never really cashed out because I didn't need the money. I was just a kid living at home with my parents. And, mm. I mean, I probably cashed out 
500 bucks a month or something. And I always viewed my job as making my bankroll go up in my account. Okay. That's all I really tried to do. So you I, never splurged on anything fun as a no. suddenly wealthy uh, college student? No. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> you didn't buy out a bar one night? No, eventually I bought a condominium. Okay. <laughs> but no, I did not do any of that. I, I mean, I was living at home with my parents. I probably had no friends. So I didn't really have much to spend my money on. Okay. And eventually I bought a condo. And then after that, I lost like a decent chunk of my cash that I had on hand because I bought the condo and that took away a lot of my cash. And then I went back this to... This the condo in Pensacola. Condo in Pensacola. Okay. Because I was always taught, you grow up and you buy a house and then you've done it. Mm-hmm. So I've already done it when I'm 18. But <laughs> it's not really how life works. I definitely suggest, I don't think the timing on the real estate market was great either, right? I think that one was okay. I bought one in Vegas when it was quite high and it went down to not very much but then i bought another one when it was very low and that one went up so mm, I've, ha- I've had some swings in real estate where they've been i bought high i bought low if you just buy across the board buy every year it's that yeah, it'll work out it all bur- it all break at even in the end yes um what were we talking about you bought a uh, oh yeah condo so in pensacola poker players should probably not put a large chunk of their net worth into something that's not very liquid mm-hmm. and i made that mistake because well if I had 200 something K, I thought, well, if I put down 150 K, what's it really matter? I still have 60 or something like that. Mm-hmm. But then I proceeded to lose 30 almost immediately, probably because they, they um, started playing 500 and $2,000 buying sit and goes, and I must have not won them. And I was getting nervous. I decided I was going to go back and play $10 buying sit and goes and win 100 buy ins at every level. Okay. And that, that 10s, was your way 20s, of 30s. Like rebuilding? Not necessarily rebuilding, but just confirming I'm competent. Oh, okay. Because for all I know, it's just running hot. For Are me. you a robot? Can I just ask that now? Probably. You seem you seem <laughs> programmed. Like you have like a, a strict regimen to your day every day, uh, a plan. You're f- laser focused. You, you work hard. You practice. I feel so incredibly lackadaisical, but I think compared to most, I am laser focused. It doesn't feel like it okay. to me though. I feel like I don't have my my act together at all. <laughs> but maybe I do okay so anyway I started with $10 games did 20s 30s 50s 100s and got back to the 200 games and just kept winning money so I wanted to I guess confirm that I was actually decent because I could still always go back to college and I I was prepared to do that if I had to I didn't want to but I, I would have but yeah. fortunately things went well enough I kept studying and went from there I paid this guy Greg Shahade um, curtains online people may be familiar with his sister Jennifer She's a poker star, pro or something like that. Isn't she like a chess, chess uh, guru? Yes, and her brother is better at chess. But he was also really good at sit and go. So I paid him a decent chunk of money, about 500 an hour, to teach me sit and goes. I was going to ask you about this. Yeah, you, you uh, shelled out, what, five grand, ten grand? Five grand, yeah. Five grand? And out of my, like, 20 to, to on have... On poker lessons. On poker lessons. Because he was crushing. He was even more disciplined than I was. I was trying to play as high as I could. He was just content to play the $100 games and yeah. crush those with a high return on investment. But I paid him, and he taught me, and I, that increased my ROI probably 3 or 4 or 5%, whatever it was, and it paid itself off within a month. Do easily. you remember what your, your particular leak was? Or? I remember a few things I was doing wrong. I was not shoving often enough from late position, so I was probably a little bit too tight. And sit and goes, you're pl- it's a somewhat short stacked game. It's very mathematical. and A lot of push-fold charts and stuff you had to memorize? A decent amount, but... I was, ICM implications. ICM implications as well. So I was shoving a little bit too infrequently from late position and too often from early position. Like I would get ace six under the gun, maybe six handed with 10 big blinds and go all in. And that's just an easy fold. And these leaks, they'll cost you some amount of money, some portion of the time. And that's enough to yeah. make you from a, I mean, you have to realize in a sit and go, you're going to win at 10% return on investment if you're great. So if you go from being just marginal, like I was probably just marginal in reality, so maybe if I was playing great, I'd have a 5 or 6% ROI. If I'm throwing it all away by shoving the A6s every mm-hmm. once in a while to, to go down to 2% return on investment, then that's not good. So anyway, I paid him, got my return on investment back up, grinded it up, and continued going. You said you paid off the lessons in a month. So like, how many singles were you playing at the time? Oh, a bunch. I was playing between three and 5000 a month of the $200 games, which is a lot. I mean, you, back then lot, you, were, yeah. you were playing, I think, 16 at a time. So there are actually four different party poker skins, which maybe people are familiar with that or not, but there was party poker and Euro poker, Euro bet. 
Oh, there were a few of them. I don't remember the names either, but Something yeah. like that. And so you would have an account on each of them, and you could play four tables on each of them. And it knew you couldn't, like, put... Yeah, it wouldn't let you... You, you couldn't um, multi-account or whatever, but... Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, you could play 16 at a time, no problem, and that's what I did. Sat there all day. I played probably 10 hours a day every day. I took almost no off days for about three or four years. And I, looking back, I wish I would have played more. <laughs> really? I was going to say, do you regret not getting out in the sunshine, but... no. I, I think if you ask most poker players who are near the top of the game, they're all going to tell you they had a period in their life where they only played poker Yeah. for the most part. I mean, maybe they took an off day here or there, but I'm not going to say you must devote yourself entirely to get really good at something, but it certainly helps. So you said three to four years? I, yeah, when I was 18 to 21, I just played online all the That's time. It's basically your college. Well, yeah. And then once I turned 21, I started playing the live circuit. But I still played online. I, I actually wish I didn't start playing the live circuit, really, because you're just not putting in very much volume compared to online. And if you're playing on, I mean, back then I was making about twenty thousand a month from the games, and then about twenty thousand a month from Rakeback, so about forty thousand a month, which oh, wow. is insane. And clearly, I mean, you're not going to make that playing live, even back then when the games were soft. And if you are, there's going to be a huge amount of variance. So if I was smart, I probably would just kept grinding. But the same you games. did. I did. That's true. Well, <laughs> I lost everything I played for the first year, which was Oh, okay, not fun. so 06 was kind of your first year out there on the live circuit. Yes. Yes. And 06, I didn't win anything. Mm-hmm. I think I actually cashed my first tournament I played and thought, oh, man, this is going to be so easy. <laughs> well, what was, the, um, what was the problem? Do you think it was adapting to life on the road? Do you think it was not having a support system of, like, a crew yet? or? Uh... I, well, I know my problem is that I only played sit-and-goes. I know how to play sit-and-goes great, but mm-hmm. that's only... 20 or 30 big blind poker at the most yeah. so you go out there to a live tournament and you're playing 100 big blind poker and then 50 big blind poker for a while and I didn't, I, was, I didn't know how to do it I had almost no experience so I learned a game that was not the same game that was played in the live venue and that led me to just sort of hanging out in the early levels never really chipping up and then having a 20 big blind stack when the average stack was 50 big blinds and even if you're great with your 20 big blind stack that's just not going to work out for you in the long yeah. run so I was playing the wrong game I played the yeah. wrong game for about a year. Then I realized, oh, I'm playing the wrong game. And so, then what was the adjustment? I learned to play the right game. I made friends with Dave Benefield and Tom Dwan, and they helped me get decent at poker. That's probably when I first met your crew. Maybe it was like Tunica, Mississippi, or Biloxi, or something like that. Probably. WPT, Tom Tom was making his first uh, live appearance, I think, at the time. But that must have been right around the time you, you had won Mirage, right? I don't know. It's all blends together. So I, I lost the whole first year, and then I cashed the, or I took fifth in the PCA Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure in two thousand seven, I guess. Yeah, January two thousand seven, fifth in the PCA for three hundred seventeen k. Back then, that was a WPT event, and that was my first big score. And mm-hmm. I assume that would probably never happen again because I realized it's hard to win these tournaments. Mm-hmm. But then I ended up. Wait, you even you well. realized that back then? I feel like everyone oh, yeah. back then was like, "This is." Printing money, I can do this forever. Well, I played for a year and I lost every one. So <laughs> when you play for a whole year and you don't, you don't really do well at all. Yeah. I mean, I probably had like minus eighty percent ROI or something, which is awful. And whenever that happens, I mean, I was very happy that happened. Looking back, because it makes you realistic to where you know you're going to have bad downswings, you're going to have good upswings, and you just can't get too affected by it either way. Was there a moment during that first year where you thought I might quit? I knew I was not going to quit because I would still be grinding the sit and goes in my spare time. Which... I mean, like just not not deal with live poker anymore. Just become that guy. Because there's a few people in the poker world who are that guy. They never got offline. They moved after Black Friday, and they they're still sitting there printing money. Nothing wrong with that. I, yeah. I think there's. I mean, that's almost ideal, assuming you can have a somewhat balanced life. Because yeah. you don't have to deal with all this crap we have to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have to go people. to people. Yeah, yeah, I have to go to Vegas and leave my, I have to leave my family for six weeks exactly. to come play poker. That's not ideal for anyone. should bring the series to New York. Exactly. Then we'd be <laughs> set. But so I, I don't think it ever really crossed my mind to stop playing the live tournaments. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I guess if I just kept losing, I guess I'd have to. Yeah. But, I mean, I was still probably making, I don't know, ten or 20000 a month just grinding online, which I would turn around and lose in live poker. But, I mean, again, I still didn't, I didn't need any money at this point in my life. I had no expenses. And when you have no expenses, you can gamble relatively hard and i also knew in tournaments you're you're going to win something eventually and i was studying and playing those more i i eventually chopped the sunday million i think probably right before i won mirage okay so i mean i was making deep runs in online tournaments i was playing a decent amount 
what I would do is I would play sit and goes all week and then play the Sunday tournaments. And that was kind of like your that was your gamble for the week. Yeah, gamble. Right. That was. I mean, that was where most of the volume was. Even I mean, it, it still is today on Sundays. So I would play my regular game in the week, and then Sundays I would play the tournaments, and usually end up putting in like half of your weekly profits from your regular game into the Sundays. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So January 07, big score at the PCA. Fast forward to the summer. You're at the Mirage. You take it down for almost 1.1 million WPT title. You're 21 years old, right? I was lucky. You were lucky? I think I was 22. But what was the... What got you to the end there? You said, was it everything finally clicking? Was it a good run of cards? What, what would you think it was? That one was a good run of cards. So at the end of the day, at the end of day one, I had a big flip against, I think it was Michael Binger. Okay. I think. Where I, I had either ace, king, or tens, and I lost. So it was a big flip for like 100-something big blinds. I got down to something like six big blinds at the end of the day, which was maybe $5,000 in equity because of the way the blind structure works. Yeah. And that was a Saturday. I remember Sunday was the next day and I was considering just skipping going to play the tournament, just play on, play online instead. But then I realized, you know, $5,000 in equity, even if it is six big blinds, you go shoot it in and then yeah. run back home and try to play online if I could. Back then, I don't even think you could le- register late. So it was one of those things <laughs> where you like had to buy in on time. But so I went back and won every hand for the rest of the tournament and ended up winning it. So that was good. Okay, but, so... You're 22, you're in Vegas, you got $1.1 million in your pocket, minus swaps or whatever percentages people had. Uh, what, what are you splurging on? Come on, it had to be one thing. I think I bought a watch, a Jacob watch. Okay. It had diamonds on it for fun. Because that's what every kid needs is a watch with diamonds on it. <laughs> Let me see it. I don't have it with me. <laughs> you still have it, though. I do. You can't bring it out here to where I'm staying now, though, because someone might rob you. <laughs> you have to be intelligent. And yeah. being flashy is often not intelligent. Mm-hmm. So, so I learned. So how does it change your life, though? The, the score, the fame, because it's on TV, too? And I mean, it's sort of the same story, though. It's, it, it, I didn't need money. So it was nice and everything, and it, it didn't really change anything. I bought a condominium off the Strip, so that was good. I had a place in Vegas, and back mm-hmm. then, all the tournaments were in Vegas, or the majority of the tournaments were in Vegas. Yeah. So it made sense to be here, and that was my logic, that if I'm going to spend... $100 a night in a hotel room, I might as well buy a condominium here. Yeah, always have something when you're in town. Right. So I did that, and that was nice. But beyond that, not, not much changed. Not much has really changed ever. <laughs> I, I've, I've tried to not be a ridiculous spender. I always buy what I want, but I don't really want much. Mm-hmm. That's the secret. Don't want much. Don't want much? Don't want, don't want many things. Yeah. What about experiences? Did you do anything fun to reward yourself? I did not. I wish I, I, wish I would have done more experiences, but I have... I don't think I really got outside of a casino until I was maybe 24 or 25 when I traveled. Yeah. So that was probably a mistake. I I still don't do it enough. I mean, like this trip, all I've done is sit in my hotel room and be at the Rio. (laughs) And I haven't even played a hand of poker yet. There's a movie theater downstairs. Yeah, I saw that. I walked by it. I almost went. And then I realized, no. No. I'm going to do something else instead. I bet if you, like, sit in the back row, you could do, like, some crunches or something while you're watching. Mm, Multitask. You know what I mean? I haven't been to the gym either, which has been very depressing. <laughs> I've just been busy. It's, it's, it's tough when you're busy. You are uh, one of the busiest people in poker, that's for sure. All right, so you win the Mirage Poker Showdown. Then you finish second at a tournament I was at, at Falls View in Niagara Falls, the NAPC. Yeah, that was fun. Scott Clements beat me heads up. Scott Clements actually won the same tournament the year before. Mm-hmm. And then a few years later, Mike Leah won the same tournament like three years in a row. So apparently Canadians who... <laughs> actually, Scott Clements isn't Canadian. He might as well be Canadian. He lived on the border, right? He, 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 we're going to call him a Canadian. Um, <laughs> they, they do well there. He's too nice to be American. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> he said to 80% of his audience. Yeah. So um, that, that was a good score. I... Remember early in that tournament, I got it all in with middle set against top set and pocket aces. The guy who had top set was Ryan Campbell, who I think owned the casino in Turks and Caicos. That was a fun trip. That was a fun trip. <laughs> um, anyway, I had middle set and I got the quads on him. So I tripled up on like the third hand of the tournament. I seem to remember this hand. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's always good to get quads. So then Scott gets you at the end, <laughs> and then a year later, you're winning another one at Foxwoods. I think that was the Jonathan versus Jonathan tournament. Jonathan Little versus Jonathan Jaffe. He yeah. was 
well, he is one, like one of the best high stakes heads up pros, which mm-hmm. is not really who you want to get heads up against. But we ended up playing a very long heads up match. I remember. And, um, <laughs> the short side just kept winning. I don't really remember much about the heads up match. I talked to Jonathan Jaffe actually about three or four months ago at the World Poker Tour Tournament of Champions, and he said that I was doing things back then that almost certainly made me a favorite in the match, which was interesting because I don't even remember the match. But he said I was shoving a lot. So basically what he said, he was opening too often, and I was probably shoving quote-unquote too often, but he was not defending enough versus my shoves. Got it, got it. So he would raise, I would shove 50% of hands, and then he would only call off like the top 15% of hands. Are so. you shoving to take away any play he has? Like Basically. It's kind I of mean, kill Phil strategy? I think it's just good poker. Yeah. <laughs> but whenever someone's raising and they're good... If you can shove and make them fold more often than they should, that's going to be a good strategy. And like even if they call off, quote-unquote, too wide, it's not like it's a great option for them. So what they should do in turn is they should start limping hands so that I can't just... If they limp with a 25 big blind stack or 20 big blind stack, I can't shove 20 or 25 big blinds without risking a lot. And you don't want to raise to three or four big blinds because then they can call in position. But he was raising to two or two and a half big blinds, and I was just shoving for 20 and picking that up more than my fair share. Okay. That's interesting for heads up strategy, and I just want to talk a little bit more about that for some reason. The tournament that you final table at the Venetian, the Card Player Poker Tour 5K, do you remember that? It was a while back. It was a while back. Anyway, you finished like 6th or 7th or 5th, something around that neighborhood. And the two people that were heads up was Alex Condon and my boss's wife, Alan Shulman. And she crushed him heads up by calling every pre flop raise and then donk betting every flop. <laughs> like he couldn't handle it he was getting visibly frustrated by her line and i'm wondering if that's something you did similarly to jonathan where it was like hey he's not playing in flow (laughs) well maybe maybe that was it is that he was not expecting someone to be shoving quite as often because i I learned in sitting goes a long time ago that if you're just incredibly aggressive like worst case you're a tiny dog okay and if that's the worst case you're a tiny dog or best case they fold too often they just run them over and you win the tournament no problem that's fine with me and so you always want to make sure you're defending your your bets properly and if someone calls your pre-flop raises and donks into you every time if you're folding too often that's not going to be good and you probably need to defend 70 percent of hands or so and if you look at a hand that's range uncomfortable 70 percent's like queen high a lot of the time yeah that's uncomfortable if you have like any draw any overcard <laughs> any backdoor equity you got to stick around and most people don't stick around often enough so it's certainly a fine strategy and if you find something like that against a particular player just abuse it until they adjust and you'll find a lot of players just don't know how to adjust or won't adjust or especially with something like that strategy of calling them leading a lot of flops a lot of people just think you're hitting good hands for the first five times yeah then i mean you just got five for free yeah and once you get five for free it's nice to i mean that's just a great setup for you well it's funny you mentioned being aggressive being like kind of like the default decent strategy for sit and goes but i heard an interview where you said that you were way too tight when you first started playing well, yeah, and that's that goes back to early in the sit-and-go, nine-handed, you should be, well, I don't know if you should be, but I was relatively tight because I knew I had a nice edge once we got down to four or five or six people. Okay. I was very good at that stage of the tournament where you could be short, shove all in. I probably did that better than most people, especially once I got the coaching from Greg, and that was something I was very good at. I was not so good at the 100 big blind poker, and I guess in my mind I probably thought if you – go broke early in the sit and go you just can't win the sit and go and you can't get in the money <laughs> and you have to understand the sit and go structure is such that they pay 50 percent of the money for first 30 percent for second and 20 percent for third so it's not really that hard to get in the top 30 percent of the field if you're just kind of tight early and then just very aggressive late yeah so basically you get down to six people you flip one time and if you win you're in the money immediately whereas if you have to flip twice because you go from maybe 10 to 8 8 to 6 because you're playing more hands well, now you're way less likely to actually get in the money. So it's not like a regular tournament where the goal is to win first place. How often do you still get to play sit and goes these days? Well, basically never. <laughs> um, the sit and go game is very, very tough online at this point. And what it amounts to is the game's not that hard, and everyone is great to where even the winners are losing a small bit of rake, and they rely on things like rake back to profit. And in order to get good rake back, very often you have to play a ton and I don't go out of the country enough to play online, mm-hmm. so I don't get, don't get to play a ton. And even then, a lot of sites are cutting away rake back, and that's just going to kill all the games. Well, it has killed all the games. <laughs> uh, so do you think online poker is doomed? I don't think it's doomed. I think that 
you see places like Party Poker and 888, they're doing a great job keeping their site good mm-hmm. for pros, but also good for amateurs. So Right, but at the same time, they're also fighting legislation. They are, but yeah. they have more of a business than just America. And yeah. they'll be fine without America, but it'd be nice if they had America. It's one of those things where you either lose some money trying to get in America, or you do get in America and you win a ton. Yeah, Kind of like the... the aggressive heads up strategy either lose a little bit or you win a ton and if if those are the options that's probably fine there you go um i want to talk to you about writing first of all okay what is your writing process because i'm a writer professionally and i don't have the motivation to write and you've written like what 40 books now i think it's 14 14 (laughs) something like that so what do you do do? are you do you walk around all day with a recorder like putting out your thoughts like do you have a, a concept and you just like lock yourself away in a room for a few days I've done it all sorts of ways. So my okay. first book came about, I was making videos for PokerStrategy.com, which was a, was or is, I don't even know. It was a basically a rake back site in Europe where... That domain you, name's too good to not be used right now. Right. So if you <laughs> gave them your rake back, they would give you poker coaching videos, essentially. So um, anyway, I was making videos for them. And one of the publishers of D&B Publishing, which was the biggest publishing company in Europe, but now it's biggest poker publishing company in Europe. Now it's the biggest one in the world. Mm -hmm. They, he was making videos as well. He was a, he is a very good online player and he was making videos. He saw my videos. He liked what I was doing. And so he came and asked me, would you be willing to write a book? Because they didn't have a book on tournament poker. And I had never written a book or anything like that, but I did have a lot of private students. And every time they would ask me a question, I would just write them an essay in an email and send it back to them. There you go. And then I realized I have about a hundred essays here on Various things. And I, I just started saving them. So I had probably 200 pages of text just already there, and I just had to organize them. So my writing process, pretty much every time, is to make an outline of things to talk about. So very broad points to start, then you fill it in. So you start, I don't know, pre-flop, flop turn river, other yeah. stuff. Then pre-flop, what do you need to know? So when they fold to you, when there's a raise, when there's raising callers, when you raise and you get three bets. So now you have a bunch of little points. Then you go, by, then you go down and you write something for all those points so you end up with three or four paragraphs or three or four pages for each point point. Mm-hmm. and if you have enough points to start with ideally if you have like 100 points and you write a page on each point that's 100 pages and then you're done <laughs> although my books end up being like 500 pages i just put out one mastering small stakes no limit hold'em i thought it was gonna be a nice clean easy book the thing ended up taking forever it's about 500 pages it has like 250 advanced images like advanced range images discussing all these situations and What's your? Uh, that was a pain. <laughs> what's your prized? Uh, what's what's the one you're you're pr- the proudest of? I think I'm most proud of excelling at No Limit Hold'em. It's by far the best selling poker book at this point, and it it's basically a collection of me with 18 other pros, where they write about 20 or 30 pages on mm-hmm. the topic of their expertise. So I found someone who's like good at heads up No Limit Hold'em. So Olivia Bousquet, very good heads up player. Mm-hmm. I you know I'm friends with all these people, and I, I realized from traveling the circuit that I have the opportunity to talk to a bunch of people about poker, whereas a lot of amateurs never have that opportunity because they talk to their local friends, yeah. but they don't get to talk to the best players in the world. So I wanted to basically have a conversation with the best players in the world. And the book's not really a conversation. It's more so them writing about their area of expertise. And that lets the amateurs into the minds of a lot of the best players. And so there are all sorts of topics, lots of great professionals involved. And also on top of that, I'm, I, am doing slash have done webinars with all the authors. So we do two webinars, roughly once every month and a half or so, where I'm online with the author, the viewers can get on, ask questions in real time, and we present on a topic and help people out. Mention the books, the webinars, the, the training videos. Um, I'm sitting at a one three table last week. You weren't even here yet at the series, so it's not like you'd won something and your name was just being mentioned at the table. I'm not. They, people don't know who I am, so they're not just talking to me. But everyone two, knows who you are. There's these two guys. No, I don't like to say what I do for a living at the poker table. It doesn't matter. Everyone knows who you then are. Then I get a bunch of terrible. Your personal picture questions. is all over every time you post anything. Oh, I hope that's not true. <laughs> we got to fix that. Um, but anyway, these two guys are having a conversation and they're talking about poker players and who they think is the best, who they think is the worst, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, well, what about hardest working? And then somebody says, uh, I think uh, Doug Polk or something for his YouTube video, uh, YouTube channel or something. And then the other guy goes, no, Jonathan Little. <laughs> Jonathan Little is the hardest working man in poker. 
how right is this man? And why was your father at that poker table? Yeah, I don't know why my dad was there. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't feel like I work that hard. It's almost like something that's constantly working in my mind. Like, if I'm not doing work, that is a bad thing. Yeah. But at the same time, I always well, try I've to work. I've never had that thought, so you have a one-up on me right there. Yeah, I, I have a desire to get stuff done. I am not a procrastinator at all. If I, if I run into a deadline, it makes me lose my mind. One of my books, actually, Jonathan Little on Live No Limit Cash Games, I was having a really tough time with it. So I was just basically going to write how to play every reasonable spot that could come up. Okay. Pre-flopping on the flop, that's fine. There's only like 100 spots. But on the turn in the river, there's like 1,000 spots. Yeah. And I ended up with like 900 pages of text, which was probably too many. And I was losing my mind. I don't know how to condense this 900 pages of text into a 250-page or 300-page book. So I had a deadline, and my wife was going to Washington, D.C. to work. She's a lawyer. She had to do work there for a week. And I decided to go with her, just shut myself in the room, and grind it out. I wrote like 12 hours a day, every day, grinded it out, got it done, started over from scratch, basically, and ended up being a very good book. But I did not like that experience. I don't like deadlines. <laughs> and, I mean, for example, I have this thing pokercoaching.com which is a poker quiz site but also we do homework webinars where i'll present a somewhat in-depth concept or question and i ask the students to provide me their answer i go through and review all their answers and we all try to improve poker together and so if i have a webinar coming up as soon as i finish the one for let's say june i immediately start working on the one for july like oh, as wow. soon as i finish it because i do not want to run into like i just Remember, oh, July 4th. Whoa. <laughs> oh, good. I knocked over the thing. Is it still working? Yeah, it's still okay. working. Okay, on July 4th, <laughs> if I have to do it on July, if I have to do my webinar on July 5th, I'll go crazy. Oh, yeah. Did I break the microphone? I got so excited. No, it's still good. All right, good. Sweet. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't like to procrastinate about anything, and I think that just helps me get stuff done because I'm always moving forward. Because you're terrified of work. I'm terrified of... Work stacking having, up. I'm terrified of under-delivering. I think a big reason people like me and my training content is that I always over-deliver, and I do it quickly. So over-deliver, quickly <laughs> and efficiently, and people will like you. You were living in um, Vegas mm -hmm. for a little bit. Now you're living in New York City. What, what was the decision there? Well, I met my wife at the Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure about eight years ago. And she was playing? She was just there for her last day of a New Year's Eve party with a few of her friends. And for whatever reason, she was by herself at the poker area. I think of her, a few of her friends left, and she just wanted to look around, and her friends didn't want to look around. So she was walking around the poker area. It was my first day there. Poker stars used to always lose my money. I would wire them money, <laughs> and they would always lose it. So I knew I have to go down there about a day ahead of time, track down my money. So I did that, and... I was about to make the mile walk back to my room because it's a very, very long way back to your rooms there. And Jonathan Jaffe, who I played heads up at Foxwoods, he found me and he said, do you want to play a $100 buy and sit and go with him, three other heads up pros, and their four girlfriends or wives. So it was me, eight other people. And a while into the sit and go, I saw a girl standing behind me. You were the and ninth wheel? I was the ninth wheel. <laughs> and when you're the ninth wheel, if you put the pieces together, you know that girl's not with someone at the table. Very good. And there's been good read. no other instance in all of poker history where a girl's been standing behind the table and not been watching a guy. <laughs> and so when you see an opportunity like that, you have to seize it. So yeah. I seized the opportunity. I chatted her up. We went out to dinner. And then she left. She went back to New York. We chatted on the internet a little bit. And... One of my students who final table the main event, Steve Beglider, he was having a charity tournament in New York about a week later. So I decided to go there for his charity tournament and to hang out with Amy. And I was paying too much for a hotel room each night, and she didn't like that. So she said, why don't you stay with me? And then I moved in, and that was it. Wow. <laughs> you moved in. I essentially moved in. I mean, you were I, pretty she, much homeless anyway as a poker player. She had a small apartment. I was allowed a two foot by one foot area for my luggage <laughs> and that was about half of her apartment so she gave me half of her apartment right off the bat it was very nice of her and i kept it and um she's obviously a saint because she puts up with having a poker playing husband i think it's very i mean she knew what i was doing ahead of time she knew like there was no surprises that i was a poker player i think a lot of people get together before someone plays poker or even when they're playing poker recreationally then they try to do it more seriously and that's a life change yeah and a lot of people don't sign up 
to a relationship thinking life is going to change significantly, especially on something that may not even be a sure thing. It's a little bit different if you get a job as a doctor or something like that. Yeah. Whereas if you go from not playing poker to playing poker, maybe just lose all your money. <laughs> and that's not what a lot of people no sign up for. But so she knew what I was doing. And it, I mean, if she didn't sign up, if she did not agree with it, we just wouldn't have been together. And it's worked out reasonably well. You guys got married a couple years ago, three years ago, four. Don't get it wrong. August 1st, 2015. It's a nice round number. She did that to help me out. <laughs> so now what year is it? 2019? Yeah, pretty much. So four years or so. We're listening to this in the future. <laughs> I mean, people will be listening to this, you know. For on, years. On the day you die, probably. Oh, so. my gosh. They probably will listen That's to That's 100 years from now. So what's that sanctuary like? I don't know. Anyway, you're also a new dad. Congratulations. Thank you. We had our baby James on, let's get it right. December twenty fourth, two thousand sixteen. Oh man, that's like my mine's a, a early January baby, so it's like double presents. Mine's December twenty second. Yeah. So I, I didn't get any presents. Oh, that's you didn't get double. No, I got none. None. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's how it works. They cancel each other out. If you have a birthday too close to Christmas, you get nothing. I always had lots of presents as a kid. My parents, <laughs> my parents gave tons and tons of presents. So thanks to them for that. And yeah, I've seen you you uh, repay them for their generosity. I, uh, they made the final table with you. They did. At the World Series of Poker. They had a tag team tournament last year. And I wasn't even planning on playing it because I, I tr try to not play too many small buy-in tournaments. If it's a $1,000 tournament divided by two or three, it's a $300 tournament, 333 or 250 Not worth your time. Not worth my time. But my dad was here and he said... I want to play this tag team turn. I'm going to play it with your mom. I said, oh, well, put me on the team for fun. And so he put me on the team. I played one orbit to start. And then my dad and my mom played, and they were just chip leaders for like the first day. I don't know how, but they were chip leaders. It's because they've and, been watching your videos. I mean, they have been. They watch all, your books. They watch all my stuff. And so then in day two, I played a decent amount. Then my mom hopped in. She won some hands. My dad hopped in. He bluffed off like half of our stack. <laughs> and he was, you could tell he was visibly flustered. So I'm like, come on, come on, let's get out. Yeah, and um, I hopped down. I sat down. Very next hand, I get pocket aces. We double up. It was a lot of fun. It was actually an interesting spot in that tournament. Very late, I think like twelve handed. I think I had about twenty big blinds, and I had pocket queens. So someone in middle position raised maybe two big blinds. I made it six big blinds on the button. This guy in the big blind who had been talking to my mom the whole trip, because every that was an interesting tournament because there was a huge rail. Every, yeah, basically Everyone's everyone got their partners on the rail. Everyone had two or three people on the rail. Whereas in a regular tournament, you have no one on the rail or maybe <laughs> one person. So they've been chatting it up. This guy was talking to my mom about how he loves all my videos and he loves my mom and their friends. Anyway, this guy makes it eighteen big blinds in the big blind. So it goes two big blinds, six big blinds, eighteen big blinds. That's like all my stack. Folds back to me. I'm just about to reluctantly put it in because you know you got queens. And he's, he starts winking at me. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. He so, winked at so, you? So I found a fold. And he did not show, but he swears up and down he had aces. So He had jacks. He had jacks, exactly. <laughs> he really got, he either really got me or, or they, did me a bit of a favor. Yeah, did you a huge <laughs> favor. So anyway, we ended up taking ninth place. Right at the beginning of the final table, I had ace jack against ace seven, and I did not win. So I was right behind you. I remember... But now the Little family has a final table cash on their resume. They do. That's pretty sweet. My mom has played one tournament, and she's cashed it, final tabled it. <laughs> My dad has a final table. It's kind of unfortunate, though, because we, I wanted them to play, and they, want, they, were like, they were afraid to play because they don't want to squander this opportunity. That final table wasn't really like the tag team final table. I mean, like, there were some big names there. Inevitably, at all these final tables... That was when Doug Polk and Ryan Fee won. Right. There's always someone reasonable on most teams yeah and usually that person is the one playing the final table so of course. i got to play it for my, my five minutes but i really wanted them to play it because <laughs> they they are not gonna have as many opportunities as me to play the final table so i wanted them to play it but they didn't want to play it they wanted me to do it they would rather try to maximize their equity they assume i'm going to make better decisions than them which may or may not be the case i think i think it was the case you just got a little <laughs> unlucky um what's up with uh the new uh, Jonathan Little, the the marathon man. Marathon. What's up with that? What's a marathon man? I thought you, because you've been running marathons, haven't you? I only ran one marathon. Well, how I, did that go? It was not very fun. I didn't enjoy it. No? <laughs> I'm not going to do it again. So my wife liked to run races before I met her. I say races, like, you know, six-mile 
run. She wasn't trying to win or anything, just to get her out of the house and go do something. Yeah. So I joined along, and me being me, I decided I want to go harder and harder. So I would always run with her, so I wasn't really trying to run for speed. She was a little bit slower than me. I was more so just doing it and trying to make it more difficult. So how do you make it more difficult if you can't run faster? Well, you run farther. So we ran a few half marathons, then we ran a marathon. Actually, it was the year that they canceled the New York Marathon because of Hurricane Sandy because it messed up Staten Island a decent amount, I think. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we still ran it in the park. We ran – there's a big six-mile loop in the park, in, in Central Park. So we ran that loop three and, a, or four, three and a half times, whatever it was. I don't know. We ran – I can't do math today. We ran 28 miles, which is a lot. And after that, I was either going to run a 100-mile race, because that's what's next, clearly, or try to run fast by myself. So I decided to try to run fast by myself. I wanted to do a five-minute mile. In school, I could run like an eight-minute mile, maybe. Yeah, but, get that Presidential Physical Fitness Award. Right, <laughs> which, which I got. Yeah. I could do a lot of sit-ups. It's a nice ribbon. Yes, I got a fancy, fancy ribbon for that in eighth grade or something. <laughs> but so... I ended up getting down to like five minutes, 30 seconds for a mile, but I ended up hurting my foot, my right foot. Apparently, you don't need to run fast if you're a fat boy like myself. (laughs) And now I don't run much anymore. Now I ride on a stationary bicycle and lift weights. There you go. Bulking up. I've been doing more like body weight exercises, so handstands and back bends and stuff like that. Cool. Uh, So we got some rapid fire questions if you're ready. (sighs) Okay. What's the worst bad beat you ever put on anybody? I don't know. You don't. I don't remember when I bad beat someone. I, I, I don't That's remember. The problem with this question. I don't remember poker hands in general. Let's just see. Did I ever bad beat anyone? Really? I feel like you've recited three hands from memory in this podcast alone. Yeah. <laughs> I remember my worst bad beat when I was playing thirty sixty limit hold'em as a as a kid. Okay. I had kings, and my opponent had aces, and we capped it on the flop or capped it pre flop. Then it came king king two. <laughs> and we capped it, and we came an ace, and we capped it, and then it came another ace, and I bet, and he raised, and I re-raised, and I just he re-raised, and I just called. You so saved I, a bet. I probably saved one bet on the on the end, but yeah, he had aces, so that ended up. Call, I don't remember what it was, but it was like three k or something. So. But luckily, you won the bad beat jackpot for that didn't exist back then, unfortunately. <laughs> so that that was not a good one. I don't really remember putting bad beats on people, but I, I'm sure I have. Actually, I have, every year at the World Series, at least two or three people come up to me and say, man, you really got lucky on me in blank tournament three years ago. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am not afraid to go all in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you say to that? Say, wow, that really, great. that really bothered you for a while. It you should does, probably let go of It bothers that. people for a while. you got to let go. <laughs> uh, biggest pot you ever won or lost? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, same answer. It must have been heads up in some tournament. I remember I was playing, I mean, I don't remember any specific hand. I was playing 200, 400 PLO for a while online, and I won some big pots in that. But I don't remember any specific hands. I mean, I, you, won, I am, you won 20 grand in, in, a, in a psychology class, so. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't remember specifics very well in general, and that's a problem. So in my in my iPad, I keep a note file on poker players, like reads on them and bet sizing tells and whatnot. So every time I sit down at the table, I look up what I know and use that because I can't remember stuff like that at all. You want to open it up and read one at random? No, that's okay. <laughs> I'd like to see those notes. I wonder if there's anything personal. They're like, oh, where's the same shoes every week? I saw a guy the other day who I have a really good one on. Whenever he is bluffing... He takes his chips and kind of like counts them out in like little four piles, like four stack, pot, four high piles. And when he is, when he has a good hand, he just puts out a big stack just every time. It's that reliable. Like clockwork. What about you? Have you ever uh, found one in yourself that you have to cut out? I think I know of some tiny things that I do and I'm aware of it and I try to fix it. A lot of stuff is like really subconscious though. It's not fixed yet, so you can't say it? Correct. Got it. I think it also has to do with stuff like just looking at specific hands slightly too long pre-flop. So you look down at aces, okay. maybe you look at your aces for 1.2 seconds, and you look at every other hand, one second. And, like, I know I'm doing this, but the odds of someone perceiving that is so low. Yeah. Because, like, 1.2 seconds versus 1.0 seconds is minimal. But I'm sure I have tells. Everyone has tells. It's just really hard to pick them up unless you can see someone's cards every single hand. Well, you're famous for your mirrored sunglasses from a Blue Shark. I didn't realize I was that famous for that kind of thing. I don't really wear sunglasses much anymore at the table. Not anymore? 
I just remember we had, like some of the best photos we took <laughs> were of the reflection in your sunglasses. I'm wondering if you did that just because you're worried about eye tells. I primarily wore sunglasses so people didn't know what I was looking at. So it Got wasn't really for my benefit. It was for their benefit. I have a relatively decent poker face. And I don't, you don't want people to know that you are looking at specific things or what you are looking at. So that's the one main benefit of sunglasses for someone like myself. I always find that awkward because I don't wear sunglasses. But I liked, if I'm not first to act, I don't like to look at the flop until the other person does. And they always notice when you're looking at them instead of the cards. Exactly. So and it's always a little awkward. And I feel like it makes them more aggressive to you later in the hand. Or just makes them seize up a little bit. To where yeah. they don't give off something that they may have given off if you weren't paying attention. Or doesn't look like you're paying as much of attention. I mean, the main times I wear sunglasses now is just when the game is very serious and there's no way to make it casual. If you, if you show up to a table and everyone's just like having a good time... You don't want to do anything to make that game not a good time. So that means don't wear sunglasses and don't wear headphones and don't be a jerk. Yeah. And be friendly to people. Be sociable, yeah. Right. And sometimes, though, you'll show up at a very high-stakes game where everyone's just super serious. You can't make the game casual. And if everyone's going to be super serious, you have to be serious yourself. And I say serious. I mean, you're always taking the game seriously. Yeah, yeah. But you got to wear your sunglasses and... Wear, wear a scarf on your face <laughs> and things like this. But like during this World Series, if I had to guess, I'm going to put on sunglasses maybe one day or maybe two days out of the whole time. All right. Um, I don't know if you happen to have any big degen stories, but what about just like the biggest non-poker bet you've ever made? Are you a side better at all? I am so not a side better because <laughs> You I rolled guess... with some people back in the day, though, that used to put up some crazy bets. I have rolled with some people who like side bets. But I don't like side bets because I have no clue how to, cl- how to like quantify the edge. And <laughs> if someone says they can do something and they're willing to put money on it, in my mind, presumably they can. Like, like if you told me you could jump off the balcony here and land on your feet 25 floors below and you wanted to bet 100K on it, I'd assume you could probably do it somehow. I didn't say I would live. <laughs> exactly. See, you know, stuff like this. I will land feet first. Right, right. And Maybe. See, I don't know. If some, I'm, I'm just not convinced that people are proposing bets that are clearly bad for themselves. And I mean, I could propose a bet for you to do that, and then you say, sure, and you'd go do it, and then I'd just be an idiot when you survive. But prop bets are fun, but I do not know. I don't, I don't like risking my money on things that I am completely clueless about. I. That seems like the smart play. <laughs> I don't know. A lot of people have made a lot of money off prop bets. I mean, I think there are quote unquote poker players who are more so prop bet players. And oh not, yeah, they're not always poker looking for the edge. Um, what is your favorite tournament destination, and why is it Turks and Caicos? Well, yeah, that was that was a really fun trip. No, that was that was a weird trip because like day one got canceled, and everyone got there like a day early and had a whole day to party on the island by themselves, basically. There was like very few people there. I remember watching someone playing five thousand dollar buy in ping pong matches, and um, this one guy had had too much to drink and he lost about five in a row. And then he proceeded to destroy the ping pong table. Mm-hmm. And security came all around and he just like took a thousand dollars out of his pocket and threw it at him. And he said, "Leave me alone!" <laughs> and then he ran off. <laughs> yeah, that sounds familiar. I remember there was a person who tried to stay in a pool for 24 hours that trip. I remember that as well. Someone tried to stay in the ocean for 12 hours. Yeah, you wouldn't think it'd be... deep in the ocean for you, 12 hours. You wouldn't think it'd be hard to stand in the ocean, but apparently it'll kill you or something like <laughs> this. It, it lowers your body temperature to yeah. where you, you'll get hyperth- hypothermia or something like that. See, that's a good example. Like you wouldn't, I would not think, without thinking too much, that it'd be hard to stand in the ocean for 12 hours. Yeah. Like, why should it be hard? Yeah, why should it? Right, but it's <laughs> impossible. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, who's the best poker player that we've never heard of? You've heard of everyone by this point. I have, maybe. But uh, I'm going to go... Uh, who's not getting their fair recognition? Some people may know this guy. I'm going to go with Rob Tenyon. You know Rob Tenyon? No, you got me. There you go. He's won the Sunday Million twice. He runs the Pokar Backing Stable. Okay. He... Um, Started streaming on Twitch a little bit, and he's out here at the World Series. You should find him and talk to him. Okay. He has a site, max, max-value.com. What's his last name again? T-I-N-N-I-O-N. There you go. There's your shout-out. He hired me. I don't know if I can say this. He hired me to coach him like two years ago, 
And I very quickly realize he's much better than I am. Really? <laughs> you gave him a full refund, I'm sure. <laughs> no, uh, but I did buy into Pokar. <laughs> there you go. So, um, so I'm paying him every month to manage the site. <laughs> um, I don't. You said you don't really listen to headphones at the table. No, but, not really. But when you do, what are you listening to? Usually classical music. Okay. Something chill. Is that like a mind technique? Or is it just because you I, like those instruments? I just don't like things that make it hard for me to concentrate. So I don't like anything too incredibly upbeat. I know some people like feeling angry almost at the poker table. like they're Yeah, like upbeat. a pump-up music or right. something. Yeah. They, they want to be in the fighting mode. I, I more so need to keep myself in the chill mode because if I okay. get in the fighting mode, I'll punch myself in the face. <laughs> and that's not ideal. I hear you. Um, you mentioned a bunch of jobs you had before poker. What was the worst one you had? I liked, I liked all of my jobs. I never had a problem working. Even even McDonald's? I enjoyed McDonald's. I thought it was one of the easiest jobs I've ever had. You just, things pop up on the screen, you make it, and you send it out. Never had any big uh, fuel spills at the airport? Yeah, we've had some issues at the, at the airport. One of the, I guess, the most scared I've ever been at the airport, there was a hurricane, and I had to drive the truck from one side of the airport to the other side to fill the truck up. There was a humongous gas tank full of gas. But it was a 20-minute drive away. There are two sides of the airport. There's a public side and a private side. And okay. I was on the private side. I had to go to the public side where all the big jets are. That's where they keep the big gas tank. So anyway, the water, there was just like a flood, basically. So the water went from being almost no water to up to like the side of the door, <laughs> like the window of water. And I thought I was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> I was out there and it was just like horrible winds, horrible rain. And I knew I had to get a truck. All the way um, to that side and back. You think they would have shut down the airport for the hurricane? Yeah, you would think. But maybe it was to where like wasn't really much happening, and then all of a sudden just hit really hard out of nowhere. Yeah, it, that was <laughs> that was very scary. Uh, if you weren't playing poker today, what would you be doing? I don't know. I think I'm so far removed from the regular world to where I can't give a good answer for that. I mean, I was going to college for engineering, so presumably, if I wasn't playing poker all the time, I would have been an engineer. Yeah. I'd probably be making garage doors or doorknobs, most likely. You just in the door accessories? Or what? Well, that's what engineers do. Oh, I didn't know that was their main thing. <laughs> you're not, I mean, there are a lot of doors in this world. I don't know if you're aware of this. Every, every building has a door and or a garage. My door. bathroom doesn't have a door, and I think that's the weird thing about Vegas. Mine, mine may not have a door here. I'm not entirely sure. I haven't tried shutting it yet. But yeah, Vegas, Vegas is weird. Super weird it's, architecture. It's just open. Yeah. You gotta live free out here. <laughs> uh, which poker pro did you admire coming up, and did you ever get to play a pot with him or her? Hmm. I don't really know if I admired anyone in particular. Or was Starstruck? Or... I always remember thinking Daniel Negreanu was cool, and Daniel Negreanu now tells people to buy my books whenever he has the opportunity, so that's very nice of him. Yeah. So I guess he likes me well enough. He's been having some great runs at the World Series this year. I was just commentating last night, and I think he took fifth or sixth, maybe sixth in the sixth? horse event. Mm -hmm. He did not win any pots. It's tough when you don't win any pots in limit. Um, I remember my first big tournament was to the Party Poker Million, and I always loved Mike Sexton and Phil Ivey and Barry Greenstein, and they were all there. And I was kind of starstruck seeing them as you know, just a young kid. Did you ever get to take a pot off of any of them? I've taken pots off all of them. There you go. <laughs> oh, I got Mike Sexton really good in a, in a the World Series event one time. I think I had like King Jack and he had Ace King. and I want to say I had three bet preflop or something and it came like King Jack three. So I just got him. And <laughs> he's like, can you believe this guy three bet me with King Jack offsuit over here? <laughs> That's not what he did on the, on the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we wrap up the podcast uh, every time with a random question from the random question generator. Oh, boy. What kind of old person do you want to grow up to become? Well, you want to be the old person who's a nice, cool old person. What, what makes a cool old person? So I was signing books yesterday, at, or two days ago at the Rio during the seniors' events, because mm -hmm. seniors love me. And some <laughs> old people would come up and... Seniors, they love me. They do. Some seniors would come up and they would like have a tough time getting around, and they would not be quick, you know, like okay. quick-witted. And then other seniors would come up, and you would think they're like 40 years old. And the guy's like, yeah, I'm 83. And he's with it, running around, 
seems in very good shape, and the guy's 83 years old, and I want to be one of the seniors who is with it. That said, I don't know if you have a ton of choice in the matter, because you can try to st- do your best to stay in good shape when you're young, and I think that certainly helps. Like, the guy who was in good shape talked about how he ran marathons all the time, and yeah, yeah, yeah. he works out still, and he takes care of You're not guaranteed to not lose it all mentally. That's that's the issue. I mean, my dad's mom had Alzheimer's, and that could certainly get me. I mean, yeah. uh, you're not immune from that kind of stuff. Maybe technology will solve it by the time I get older, but it would be nice to be one of the older people who are with it. Well, how long do you think you can do this? The this year- podcast? I mean, maybe an hour or more? <laughs> the, ye- <laughs> the yearly grind of, uh, you know, imagine year 22 at the series. My, my yearly grind is currently pretty easy. I, okay. I'm not grinding super hard anymore. I already know I don't want to play all the time. I mean, you'll see some players just play all the time. Mm-hmm. And Damn. I don't particularly enjoy that. And I realize I don't particularly enjoy that. I've realize the goal is to be happy at the end of the day whatever that means and as long as you are providing for your family and you're happy then what do you really want and that has led me to stop traveling quite so much and that's in turn made me enjoy playing poker a little bit more which is nice I can't so, think of a, a, a better thought to end it on yes Jonathan thank you so much thanks for having me that's the show thanks again to Jonathan you can find him on social media at Jonathan Little Make sure you check out his new book, Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em, and everything else he has to offer at jonathanlittlepoker.com. If you haven't already done so, please rate, review, and subscribe. Thanks for listening. Attention American poker players. Do you want to legally cash out your poker winnings to PayPal? Then head to globalpoker.com and see why it's the fastest growing site for U.S. players. That's globalpoker.com.